Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the opportunity that we have while we have it to feast upon your word together. We thank you, dear Lord, that we have a forever home. We're so grateful and thankful for one another. We just ask that you would allow us to continue to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and this is the third part and the final part in the series, uh, Our Forever Home. We're going to be talking uh, this evening about the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. Now after uh, the uh, present heaven and, and earth are dissolved at the end of the millennium age, the kingdom period, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. We know that from Isaiah, uh, from uh, Peter and Revelation. Uh, by a definite act of creation, God calls into being a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be very exciting, I'm sure. You know, as God created the uh, heavens and earth to be the scene of His theocratic display. So God will cre create uh, the new heavens and the new earth to be the scene of the eternal theocratic kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom, not the thousand years, but the eternal kingdom. Uh, God's uh, or Israel's covenants uh, guarantee that, uh, that people, the land, a national existence, a kingdom, a king, uh, and spiritual blessings in, in abundance. Therefore, there must be an eternal earth in which these blessings can be fulfilled. By a translation of the old earth, Israel will be brought into the new earth uh, to enjoy forever, that's a long time, all that God has promised to them. And then it, it shall be eternally true. Uh, the scripture, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them 
and be their God, Revelation 21, 3. The creation of the new heavens and the new earth is the final preparatory act anticipating the eternal kingdom of God. It is now true that God has a kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness, uh, 2 Peter 3.13. In relation to the eternal destiny of the church saints, uh, we should take note that uh, uh, our destiny primarily is related to a person rather than a place. And while the place does loom with importance the place is overshadowed by the person into whose presence we will be taken it's something we all look forward to when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall we also appear with him in glory we, we saw that in Colossians chapter 3 for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I believe our, our death is the rapture. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's going to happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. We'll be like him just by looking at him, seeing him. It is the person who is emphasized in all of the passages dealing with the glorious expectation of the church uh, rather than the place to which the believers are taken. The Lord Jesus Christ will be dwelling with men on the new earth in the eternal kingdom. And since Scripture reveals that the church will be with Christ, it is my conclusion that the eternal abode of the church will likewise be in the new earth, in that heavenly city, New Jerusalem, after the thousand years when the new, new earth and new heavens are created. That has been especially prepared by God for us. You know, uh, it, it, it'll be an answer to the Lord's Prayer. For those God had given him, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. We're going to be with him where he is. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. John chapter 17. Since the eternal glory of Christ will be manifested in the eternal kingdom, in his eternal rule, it's just natural that the church should be there to behold that glorification of Christ forever. It is my contention, dearly beloved, that in heaven you will serve God as you always wished that you could. We are seen before the throne of God. We're seen serving Him day and night in His temple, Revelation chapter 7. Every single last born-again believer in Christ. Every Christian serves Christ, but none of us serves the Lord as we would like to serve Him. But that's about to change. All who love Christ worship Him, but none of us worships as we would like to worship. Don't you find yourself at times asking, why is my heart so sluggish? Why is my response to the grace of God so restrained, so calculating? Every Christian wants to serve Christ, but we find ourselves in conflict. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mark chapter 14. We throw ourselves into serving Christ and into living for Christ and working and laboring uh, for Christ and 
and then we get tired or we become discouraged, we get bogged down in our unsolved problems and our unanswered questions. But this will not always be the case. People think we're crazy. A lot of people do, but folks, we're not. You will serve God as you always wished you could. Day and night, they serve Him. No tiredness there. Imagine just not even getting tired. Here we go through seasons of feeling distant from God and, and we want to have a new and a, a fresh experience of God and we look for that in ways that we shouldn't, that, that's fleshly. But in heaven, you will be before His throne, you will be with Him, and you will enjoy Him forever. What a wonderful God that we serve. In heaven, Christ will lead you into ever-increasing joy. The Lamb in the midst of the throne will be our shepherd. And He'll guide us. He'll guide us to springs of living water. Revelation chapter 7. You might think, you know, heaven's going to be a wonderful place where I'm going to discover all kinds of marvelous things. Yes, it will be a wonderful place without a shadow of a doubt. But John is telling us it's better than that. What's missing? Christ is the great shepherd of His people. He feeds them, and that is why they are never hungry. And He leads them. Christ does this for us on earth. He does that here. And He will do that for us in heaven the Lamb of God, our beloved Savior, will guide us to springs of living water. The great joy of heaven is not golf courses and horse ranches, but it's that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself will lead, lead you and I into ever-increasing delight. I believe He will delight in fulfilling every single desire of our heart. Some of you have found a favorite place to go to on vacation. You keep going back over and over and over over the years. You've gotten to know it better and better. And after many years, you know most of what there is to know about it. There's no restaurant, you know, that you haven't eaten at. No shop that you haven't bought something at. And no hotel that you haven't stayed in. You will never get to that place in heaven. Heaven will be an infinite world of new discoveries. And Jesus Christ will unfold them to you. Of this, I have no doubt. The divine perfections will be an unbounded field in which the glorified shall walk eternally, seeing more and more and more of God since we can never come to the end of eternity. Life in the new heaven and the new earth will be more than life in the, in the Garden of Eden. Not only the Creator, but the creation itself too will be an object of wonder to the redeemed. It will challenge our intellect. It will fire our imaginations. It will stimulate our new senses. The scenario is a thrilling one. Brilliant minds in powerful bodies in a transformed universe. And this joy will go on increasing forever. Our knowledge will increase. For as we increase in, in the knowledge of God, we will see more of His, of His excellency, more of His beauty, and the more that we see of His beauty, the more we will love Him. And the more that we love God, the more delight and happiness we will have in Him. Folks, we are talking about exponentially increased joy. What do you think that that's going to be like after a million, million ages? 
because in heaven all of your wounds will finally be healed God will wipe every single tear from your eyes every tear dearly beloved literally the tears will be wiped out of our eyes this is telling us God removes not only the tears but also the source that produces the tears even the tear ducts all the baggage that you carried there's nothing to carry now it's gone the temptations that you battled there are no battles now the pain that you suffered no suffering now John sees the glory of heaven the presence of Jesus the glory of the new creation no death no mourning no sins to confess no temptations to overcome no sickness to suffer no pain to endure no crosses to carry no fears to face all of your questions will be answered all of your doubts will be resolved we were once crushed but look at us now our longings are fulfilled our needs are met our joy is complete dearly beloved our joy is as is not complete but it will be this is what lies ahead for you it should help you in whatever you're facing today this is our father's house and what a grief it must be to him that so few of his children want to go home here we are in enemy territory amid the sufferings of the present time beset by sin and and seeing our father's name dishonored all around us and yet we want to stay Paul longed to depart and be with Christ which he says was better by far but at the same time he says I've got to be ready to continue on here and stay on for your sake willing to stay for the sake of the work still to be done but longing longing to get home and I know many of you out there since you've been awakened to the Revelation 12 sign back in September of 2017 that's been six years now going on we're going on six years seems like a long time but it's not according to God's timetable and what we tend to do is we we tend to get lax and careless and overly concerned with all of the problems and all of the the issues of life that we face daily and a lot of that is understandable but what God desires the most of us is that we trust him though he slay me yet will I trust in him that is what he desires of us now at the present time and I fear that most Christians are not doing that they trust in themselves not in God oh they give lip service but when it comes to their faith actually being in the God in the God of all creation the, that he is faithful trusting in a God who is faithful who cannot lie and placing our hope in him resting in him knowing that he's forgiven us of all of our trespasses all of our sins he's cast them as far as the east is from the west he's buried in in the depths of the sea he says I will remember them no more he bottles our tears he knows the paths that we take that when he's tested us we shall come forth as gold I've been in communication lately with a brother who's going through some very difficult trials very trying time, times he compliments me on on how that this ministry has helped him better understand his walk and his relationship with Christ what I fear that he fails to understand is how much he's helped me is how much all of you help me we are to encourage one another as the day draws near there's nothing that we could do any greater 
Surely we can take time out of our daily lives and all of our responsibilities, all of the weight, all, all of the, enor the enormous list of things that, that tend to preoccupy ourselves while we're here in this body. Take time out to talk to one another, to commune with God, to tell Him how you feel, not be a, to approach the, the throne of God boldly, the throne of grace, without reservation, because He has nothing against us. He loves us with an undying love. He'll never stop loving us. He'll never stop loving us anymore or any less than what he, how He loves us now. You, we cannot earn God's favor Period. Okay, Any ministry, any Christian so-called ministry that is telling you that you must earn God's favor in order to be accepted or approved by God and not be rejected by God, you must go down the list and make sure that you do everything, well, everything what? It's, it's man's commandments. It's traditions of men. There is nothing for you to do. If what you do for Christ today is not because you love Him, don't do it. Don't waste your time. It, that should be the only motive besides the life motive, de life out of death, which is, a, which is a, a very real practical principle in the Christian's walk. You know, I've, I've spent years believing, uh, I, I went years believing that there was nothing greater than love. And that's, and that's what the Bible says. Faith, hope, love, the greatest of, the, of these is love. And, and we know that that is the greatest of all uh, of the three. But folks, that is not the, the primary principle which sustains us. It is the primary principle which sustains us is God's love and God's grace. If you know that, if you really know that, if you know just how much He loves you, if you really understand His grace, it's not going to be hard for you to do the things that you would like to do. I think you're going to see more, more your, yourself function more out of the new man, the new nature, than the old. We've talked. Uh, I've I've spent some time on this channel talking about the sinless new nature. Dearly beloved, in eternal in glory's eternity, we will not sin. We cannot sin. We, we will not have the ability to sin. And what Christians need to understand, I I wish they could understand. I wish I pray every day that Christians would come more and more. More Christians would come to understand that they have a sinless new nature now that cannot sin. We leave behind the old someday and we will become like Him. I want to say that it's kind of unfortunate, you know, that God didn't really seem to have a whole lot to say about the eternal state. You know, when time is no more, you know, when all of the God's program for redemption and salvation is complete, the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, He didn't have a lot to say about it. And I think that the reason, one of the reasons, and I'm just speculating here, but I think that perhaps maybe one of the reasons He did not have much to say about it is so that we wouldn't be so occupied with the place rather than the person. Christians today, they hear very little about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What did Christ do when He died in your place? He took upon Himself your sin. He was made to be sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We stand before God Righteous, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. 
how in the world could we ever possibly as Christians have any hope, blessed hope for glory if we didn't trust Him concerning our eternal life? And not if we didn't understand what He done for us. If, he, if, we, just, if we just don't understand what Christ did for us, how in the world are we going to experience His best for us here now today? To me, at least, it doesn't seem like it's very hard to just come to understand those, those facts, those, those biblical truths, that, that sound biblical doctrine that puts us on an even keel and helps us sail into eternity with the full assurance that what Christ did was sufficient. I think we know the words. I think we know the verses. We've heard the verses. We, we mouth the Scriptures, but our heart is still wicked above all things, and it condemns us. Satan stands before God accusing the brethren day and night. I'm not going to fault any Christian for having doubts. The fact of the matter, folks, the wonderful truth of it is that if you are in a, a pit of doubt, it's because God placed you there. We have to come to the end of ourselves. Where self-reliance ends and trust in Him begins. And sometimes that's hard. I, I would say most times that's hard. Because God has to take us through some experience which teaches us that truth. Our, he's our loving Heavenly Father. We didn't have earthly parents like, like Him. Oh, they tried. They did the best they could. But our Heavenly Father is perfect. And He calls us complete in Christ. Complete in Him. I love you all. I truly do. Stay focused. Keep your, keep your heart, your mind, your affections set on things above, not on things below. For we have died, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Did you know that your life is hidden with Christ in God? Nothing can harm you. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.